saints peace love and grace of christ jesus be with all of you out there hope everybody is doing fantastic today in our last study chapter 16 of acts we saw paul timothy and silas travel into the city of philippi a city of roman territory filled with gentiles in the region of macedonia and we saw how paul meets timothy a young man who Paul loves dearly and Timothy's mother is Eunice a Jewish believer she most likely became a, a believer back during Paul's first trip through Lyconia the Galatian region and we found out through study that Timothy's father was Greek and according to Jewish law if one parent is Jewish and the other parent was a Gentile in this case is a Greek Gentile then the child is automatically considered to be Jewish. So Paul has Timothy circumcised to appease the law-minded Jews for the sole purpose of opening doors for Timothy to preach the gospel of grace in the synagogue. The next thing we saw in our study in Acts 16 was how Paul received a vision from a man in the region of Macedonia while Paul was at the city of Trous. So Paul sails from Trous to Neapolis and he ends up eventually in the Roman city of Philippi where he meets a woman named Lydia. Now a couple of interesting facts about Lydia that we didn't discuss in the last study is Lydia was a business woman. Okay? She was most likely a widow and also she was most likely very wealthy. And Lydia is a Greek woman from Thyatira and guess what region this Thyatira is in it is in the region of Lydia she was named after the region that she was from she was in the business of import and export of different materials specifically purple cloth the dye used to color the different cloths purple was very rare and very expensive and a very lucrative business so Lydia was a wealthy businesswoman she was well known in Philippi and Lydia most likely employed many of the local women in that area and she was looked up to so next we're introduced to the power of the enemy specifically the enemy possessing a young woman giving this young lady the power to predict the future fortune telling and we see fortune tellers all over the world today don't we it's not hard to find your horoscope it's all over the place your zodiac signs your astrology your tarot card readers your psychics your ESP your palm readers they're all over the world today and yes the enemy is still behind the power of all those practices so don't be fooled and don't mess with any of those things stay away from them or else you're gonna invite the enemy right into your home and suddenly your life will be flipped upside down it's very dangerous stuff to play around with then we saw how a Roman guard got saved he and his household and we saw how the Roman officials were terrified that anyone would find out that they beat and imprisoned a Roman being Paul the officials released Paul from jail very quietly and they wanted Paul to leave without making a big issue over the situation so the officials who jailed him wouldn't get into trouble with their Roman superiors so that's a quick overview of our last study some of the highlights if you will and today we're gonna to get into chapter 17 now setting the stage quickly Paul and Silas and Timothy they leave Lydia's house in Philippi they travel through Apollonia across the peninsula and now we're introduced to Acts chapter 17 the year is right around late 51 AD in verse 1 of Acts now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews now looking at our map we can see where Paul traveled he's starting at Philippi at Lydia's house 
moving westward, passes through Amphiopolis, and he walks down past Apollonia. Then he crosses the peninsula over to a city called Thessalonia. This is the same city that Paul is going to write books to later on, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, uh, later on from the, when he's in the city of Corinth. Now, something to add here as well, an interesting factoid, if you will, the road that Paul, Silas, and Timothy are traveling on, or have been traveling on, is called the Ignatian Way. Perhaps some of you have heard of this road before. So Paul is in the city of Thessalonia. Paul finds a synagogue called the House of Jason. And we're at verse number 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Now, if you want to know what Paul said exactly when he was reasoning with them in the synagogue, how he reasoned back with the Jews, go back to chapter 13 of Acts. Read chapter 13 and notice Paul recites the scriptures from the Old Testament all about Moses and all about how they escaped Egypt and so on. He mentions certain prophecies concerning a Savior, their Messiah, that would come one day in the future. Then Paul tells them that this Savior, this Messiah, has come. And his name was Jesus. The same Jesus that they had killed on the cross. Now Paul preaches to them. And this Jesus was their Messiah. He died on the cross. He, 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 he died and he rose again the third day. And Paul is adamant that the Jews repent from this. And turn to Jesus Christ in belief for salvation. Moving on to verse 4, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, Gentiles, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. Okay, so we see some Jews here, only a small group of Jews, believing Paul's message. But we also see a great multitude of Gentile believers added to the body of Christ. Verse 5, but the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took upon them certain lewd fellows of a baser sort, a gang, if you will, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So why were the Jews so upset about Paul's message? Well, the number one thing that upset the Jews was Paul's gospel of grace was without the law was without the mosaic system of keeping the laws was without temple worship was without sacrificing animals trying to earn their way to heaven faith plus works remember we're in the last days here okay they don't know anything about a future 2000 year period of grace as far as Paul's concerned at this point the rapture is about to happen, and he's trying to save as many of his Jewish kinsmen as possible. Paul loves his Jewish heritage. Paul is a Jew. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee, and a very educated Pharisee. So he's trying to save his, his Jewish brethren, whom he loves. And Paul, he feels like he's running out of time. He's pressured for time. He's stressed out because he thinks that the last days are upon them. Daniel's 70th week. And Paul knows from revelation of the rapture, from being raptured up himself, he knows that the rapture will happen for the body of Christ, but will not happen for his Jewish brethren who don't believe, who are wrapped up in the law. So Paul is under pressure here. That's why he's traveling so much. I mean, think about all the walking that he has to there's no cars and trains or planes you know back in this time Paul has to go by foot thousands of miles to reach his Jewish brethren and at the same time he is commissioned to preach to the Gentiles he's preaching the gospel of grace salvation by faith 
by believing without the law. That's what he's preaching during this time. And the Jews, remember, were partially blinded supernaturally, not being able to see the true truth of the gospel of grace, salvation without the Mosaic laws. They just couldn't see or understand what Paul, what his gospel was saying. And this frustration turned to anger and envy and jealousy and hatred towards Paul and the Gentiles because the Jews were seeing them come to belief and in being saved in Christ Jesus made the Jews be uh, very jealous which of course was part of Paul's strategy to bring his Jewish brethren to salvation jealousy was one tool one tool that Paul used in his strategy in verse 6 and when they found them not they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city crying these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also whom Jason hath received and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying that there is another king one Jesus and we know who the king is the king of kings is our Lord Jesus Christ of course verse 8 and they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things and when they had taken security of Jason and of the other they let them go and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea they snuck them out who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews these were more no noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily whether those things were so therefore many of them believed also of honorable women which were Greeks Gentiles and of men not a few again looking at our map following Paul Paul Silas and Timothy travel from Thessalonia they they leave Ignatian way to avoid being beaten again and probably killed they travel across to the Roman city of Berea but when verse 13 but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the Word of God was preached of Paul at Berea they came thither also and stirred up the people the Jews at Thessalonica were so filled with hate towards Paul and Silas and Timothy and Paul's message that Jesus was their Messiah and he rose again from the grave they hated Paul's message so much that they took the time to follow Paul all the way from Thessalonia all the way to Berea but what upset them most was this that salvation was now without the law Paul was teaching a lawless gospel salvation by belief alone without the laws of Moses and this angered the Jews to no end they just couldn't under they couldn't believe that Jesus was in fact their prophesied Messiah in scriptures again remember they're pro they're partially blind okay in verse 14 and then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to see to the sea but Silas and Timothy Timothy abode there still and they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens a new city Athens and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy for to come to him with all speed they departed so Paul sends a message back to Timothy and Silas to come to him ASAP as soon as possible verse 16 now while Paul waited for them at Athens his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry now Paul is deep in Greek territory he is in the city of Athens he's in the region that is called Achaia also Athens was considered the most important city in the world at this point it was a major hub of commerce it was a port city that was filled with debauchery lots of corruption lots of money going around very much like the city of Corinth if you recall in the last study chapter 16 I mentioned some of the false religions the Greeks were involved with they were worshiping many false idols all the Greek mythology of Zeus Apollos and Hercules and Adonis uh, 
Uh, you know, that's just a few. And you may recall the name Socrates, that this is where Socrates was over uh, 50 years earlier. This is the region that Socrates was preaching his philosophy. 450 years before Paul, teaching the religion of philosophy and myths. Greece is full of idolatry. And Paul is now in the middle of that idolatry. Not only was Greece in the middle of worshiping pagan deities 2,000 years ago, but you'll be surprised to know that we're still in the middle of that idolatry today. Now, let me explain by showing you some images of these pagan gods that they were worshiping 2,000 years ago. And we'll compare them to some images from today that you can find right now in this country. The first image is a statue of Athena. Now let's compare this. Let's look at the current version of Athena and we see something that everybody's familiar with, the Statue of Liberty. Next, in image number two, we see the pagan god of justice in our own country. And in image number three, we see the obelisk. Where does the Washington obelisk come from, you might ask? Well, it originates over 2,000 years ago, and it means something that you probably are not aware of. Next image, number four, this is the entrance to the U.S. Capitol building. And who decided to put the pagan god of Mars there, I wonder? Image number five, more pagan deities found in this country. Image number six, more pagan esoteric symbolism found involving the Washington Monument. Notice all the dimensions involved here. These weren't done by mistake, folks. This was indeed intentional. And there's a hidden symbolic meaning behind all of this. And it's right in front of our faces. The next image, can you see the intentional resemblance to Greek mythology here? I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's pretty prominent, if you ask me. Next, notice the pyramid. And inside the pyramid, we have three very prominent pagan gods displayed in the center of the pyramid. These are little gods, little Gs, with no significance whatsoever, because there is only one God, one God who has created all things. He is our God in Christ Jesus. So we see the Athenian Greek idol worship being brought into this country. Why is that so? Question is, are we the new Roman Empire? Are we the Greek Empire that God, God's word talks about that would rise once again during the last days? That's something to consider. Our last image, this is the Capitol building uh, dome statue. It has the false god Persephone prominently standing on top of it, facing the Lincoln Memorial. Persephone is the goddess of the underworld, the goddess of death. Why is this in this country? Why is this in our country's capital? Questions that we should be asking. And I've just listed a few examples. There are hundreds of false god statues in this country. They're in every capital city in every of the 50 states that we have. It's not just in Washington, D.C. They're all over the place. Why are they there? That's a good question. Just who is really running this country? Okay, now moving on in our study, verse 17. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews, and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, other some he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection, the gospel of salvation. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. 
for thou bringest strange, uh, certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. They had a special place where they went to gossip, basically. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Now here, Paul begins his sermon. Not only just any sermon, but this sermon is considered to be the highlight of Paul's messages, his career. In fact, it's known as the Areopagus Sermon. The Areopagus Sermon is the most dramatic and fullest reported speech of our Apostle Paul's career. Paul explains the concepts of resurrection, of the dead, and salvation. And according to the record, after the sermon, a huge number of people became believers and followers of Paul. And these included a, a woman named Damaris and Dionysius, a member of Areopagus. In verse 23, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. So Paul preaches the gospel of grace, Jesus being the Messiah, dying and being resurrected again back to life the third day. The one thing they, the Greeks, had problems with was this resurrection, and they mocked Paul for teaching such an idea. In verse 34, Howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed. Among the which was, again we talked about her, Dionysius the Arapagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Again, the few law-minded Jews reject Paul's message. The hardcore idol worshippers reject Paul's message. But we see the birth of the church at Athens here. Some of them did believe Paul's message, and they're added to the body of Christ. Amen? Notice that Paul didn't really bring up the Old Testament scriptures here. Instead, he concentrates on the death of burial and resurrection of our Lord and the reason for this it was a change in his technique is because this city was mostly filled with pagans Gentiles idol worshipers the majority being of course Greek Gentiles which had no knowledge of what the Old Testament had to say to begin with they never read the, the scriptures so Paul sticks to the gospel 
the gospel of grace. He preaches the gospel of grace here. They, being lost in their sins, filled with idol worship, the need to repent from all that and believe on Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection for salvation. So now we're at the end of chapter 17. Paul will leave Athens and he's going to travel to the city of Corinth. We're about to be introduced to the Corinthians. Paul is going to meet Aquila and Priscilla. And Paul will stay in Corinth for some time to reason once again with the Jews from the scriptures, proving that Jesus is indeed their Messiah, that he died, was buried, and rose again, the gospel of grace, salvation by believing alone without the law being attached. The year is late 51 AD to 52 AD, and Paul will write the book of Thessalonians during his stay in the city of Corinth. We're going to see that later on in our study. So in closing, to recap what we've been studying today, in this study, chapter 17, we see Paul and Silas go to Thessalonica. We see the trouble that's involved with Paul and Thessalonica. And we see many people become Christians in the city of Berea. Again, Paul preaches in Athens. And I shared with you the famous speech. The highlight of Paul's career was the speech at Arapagus. Until the next study, peace, love, grace, Christ Jesus be with all of you. Lord willing, I'll see you for our study on Acts chapter 18.